Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Tawaji from Vention. I head over the applications team here. Um, and today we're going to be talking about why you should consider automating machine tending. Um, so what we'll go over is a bit of an introduction. I want to talk a bit more about Vention, obviously, and what we do here. Um, we'll go into why you might want to automate. Um, we'll go through the process that you would take once you've made that decision and you've understood why it might be a worthwhile investment. Um, so selecting equipment, configuration. Uh, then we'll jump into justifying that investment, right? So how you can think about ROI and payback. We've built some pretty cool tools there. Um, and finally, we'll look at some case studies. So Vention has been fortunate enough uh, to be able to help help deploy um, hundreds, if not thousands, of universal robot cells. Um, and so, you know, we're going to show you a bit uh, of those different projects that we've worked on. Um, one of the ones that we're showing just here being an example, so um, a pretty cool overhead range extender there with a UR10. Um, so first off, um, a bit more about Vention. So our mission is simple, really. It's to make industrial automation easier and more accessible for all manufacturers. And that's a quote from our CEO, Etienne Lacroix. Um, so we like to talk about Vention as a manufacturing automation platform. And so we're democratizing industrial automation with an online first self-serve engineering platform. And on the right there, you can just see a couple of examples of pictures um, of different equipment that has been built with Vention with the corresponding online web-based design that you can create with it. Um, so Vention has been a UR Plus certified partner since 2017. And like I said, we've helped to deploy thousands of universal robot cells of all types for um, tons of different applications, including machine tending. Something else that's cool with Vention is we have dozens of Vention reviewed official designs for universal robots applications. So I've just highlighted a few of those there. With a Vention account, you have access to this designs library online where you're, you're able to browse these, view the pricing, view the different options, different configurations, and you're able to customize these as well to your needs. Um, additionally, on top of those Vention reviewed official designs, we have hundreds of other community designs. So our user base that chooses to publish these designs for a royalty um, is able to publish these and that can help generate a ton more ideas as well for your projects. Um, and we do a lot with Universal Robots, so you're really going to find a ton of useful designs uh, for different applications that you might be looking to do. So the main topic today, obviously, is why would you automate machine tending operations? So at a very high level, um, I'll just break down a bit what is machine tending typically used for. So obviously, it's used for tending CNC mills. It's used for tending injection and mold machines and just presses of all sorts, right? So any equipment where you have a simple pick and place motion that enters something into a machine where there's then a processing time and then you have to outfeed the part after the process has been, has been completed is a candidate for machine tending. And the most common ones are those first two there, so CNC mills and injection mold machines. The why of it, so this can help, um, this, this can be illustrated with this simple example here. So we've got two different scenarios uh, outlined here. This is for a, a machine tending operation for a CNC mill, so an operator uh, tending to two different machines without going into the details too much because that's not the point here. Um, but really what we want to highlight there, here is that the red blocks are lost operator time where the operator is probably not doing any value added work, right? Because there's just not enough time between changeovers while the machine is operating. Um, blue blocks are low value operator work. So they're not programming the machine. They're really just putting in parts and taking them out and then pressing uh, running jobs essentially. And then the green blocks at the bottom there are the CNC processing times. Um, and so from what we can see there, two different examples. So at the top there with a short machining time, around two minutes, and then at the bottom with longer machining time of six minutes, um, we can very quickly get into scenarios where an operator is going to be standing idle for two minutes at a time during changeovers or during CNC machining time. So essentially, why would you automate machine tending is because you want to avoid these inefficient operator downtime areas, um, which are also uh, not just the red blocks, but also the blue blocks. You can consider that that is low value work, right? Um, so that you could redeploy those operators to higher value work within your factory. Um, and some of these f higher value operations could be, you know, actually programming the CNCs for new jobs or more intricate finishing tasks, right? So sometimes deburring or polishing um, or just generally finishing uh, is going to re require a, a certain level of dexterity that you can't really get. Um, so now that we've looked at a, a high level of why you would want to, you know, maybe start considering machine tending, um, and there might be different reasons as well, such as, you know, the difficulty of finding labor uh, in your particular um, location and things like that, um, we're going to look at how you can configure your machine tending robot cell. 
Um, and so we find in all the projects that we've done, there's a few different archetypal designs and configurations that come up, up over and over again. Um, these are going to be fairly familiar to people who have uh, been in the machine tending industry for a while um, or the machining industry for a while. So you have um, drawer configurations. So a cobot mounting out, mounted on a mobile stand uh, with a set of integrated drawers, kind of exactly like I have behind me, actually. Um, it's basically the, the real life twin to this digital image. Um, you also have feeder systems. So uh, this is kind of typical when you have maybe cylindrical parts that can be auto automatically fed, right? So these auto feeder systems that can have much larger capacities, um, but they do have a certain level of automation in the actual part presenter. Um, very simple trays, right? So these are um, a bit better for smaller part runs, right? So you can fit fewer parts and you're going to maybe need um, more changeovers by the operator to refill the station, uh, but a very economical solution, very easy to deploy. Um, and another really interesting um, configuration that we see a lot of invention is the seventh axis range extenders. So uh, these can be used to shuttle a robot between two or more machines. Uh, that's the most typical use case. Or they can be used to shuttle the robot perhaps between feeding the machine to an outfeed station that's maybe a quality inspection station or something of the sort. Um, and we have different configurations even for these range extenders. So floor mounted and overhead are, are two possible configurations. Um, when you're looking at these different configurations and you're wondering which one is going to be the best uh, suited for my application, there's a few different aspects that you're going to want to keep in mind. Um, these are not exhaustive, but it's kind of the things that should be top of mind. So obviously the characteristics of the part to be machined or tended, um, so it's shape and size. Uh, the required flexibility of the tending cell, so its mobility, are you going to put it on casters or not? Um, ease of deployment or redeployment, are you going to be using things that help calibrate the robot to a station uh, very easily? Um, and also ease of access, right? Do you need full collaborative operation? Do you need it to be an overhead system so that you have full access to the machine? Um, these kinds of things. Uh, that kind of ties in as well with the environmental constraints, right? So ultimately, what's the equipment around the machine? How much available floor space is there? And finally, the, the desired autonomy. So that's really going to drive the size of the machine tending equipment that you're going to be using because it's going to decide the capacity of the parts presenter, right? And like we saw on the previous slide, whether you have a feeder system that can take a lot or a dryer system, uh, and then finally a tray system, right? Kind of decreasing the capacity. Uh, those would be the kind of op um, selections you would have to make. Next up would be the selection of end of arm tools. So uh, you typically start obviously with the gripper, right? So that's going to be whether it's an under actuated or parallel gripper. Um, you can also see vacuum grippers, but these tend to be the most common types that you see in machine tending operations. Uh, there's a range of add-ons that can be considered too typically to maximize ROI, so things like tool changers, if you need to be using the robot for more than one task, um, or for a dual gripper so that you can minimize robot movement to the part presenter into the machine. Um, this is an often forgotten one, cable management, so there's going to be a ton of cables coming off of the robot um, in some, certain applications, depending on the type of gripper. Obviously, sometimes with UR, you have that nice end of, um, uh, end of arm effector um, I.O. that you can use, but uh, there's, an op there's options for dressing kits uh, to be able to take care of those cables and make sure they're out of the way. Um, and there's also extra features, kind of general extra features such as air blowing, right? So on CNC milling, we see this sometimes, compressed air to blow off chips, uh, and also vision systems maybe for uh, irregular part picking. Um, and what's great with Universal Robot, you always want to look for that uh, UR Plus certified signal. Um, so um, Vention is a part of this UR Plus program, and basically what the UR Plus program permits is to have all of these plug and play components, right? So most of the integration work has been kind of figured out um, for all of these. So it means that you, you can rest assured that the integration is going to be minimal, and you're going to be able to get up and running and programming and using your equipment as quickly as possible. So we always recommend to use, to look for that UR Plus um, kind of um, sign. Um, then you can add more peripherals to your machine tending cell. Um, I think one of the best options out there and the most powerful options is Vention's machine logic for UR. So basically this lets you integrate a Vention machine motion controller with the UR controller and add a ton of peripheral equipment, whether it be conveyors, small actuators, rotary tables, or um, full, act, full size actuators for things like range extenders. Uh, you're able to build a full robot cell based off of that robot um, universal robots controller uh, and again we're universal robots uh, we're UR plus certified and we've been a part of that since 2017 and the types of applications just to show kind of a generic example 
right? Adding a couple of different slides with um, a rotary table. I mean, this is something that's very easily done with a single machine motion controller straight out of the box. Um, now that you've hypothetically selected your robot cell, we're going to take a look at how you might go about justifying this investment. And for this, we've actually built a payback model. Um, and this is a tool that we're happy to share with you. Um, it's something that lets you input 11 different parameters so that you can tailor the scenario to your needs. And we allow you to compare, okay, how is my current process looking versus what could it look like if I was to automate with a universal robots, um, robot cell. Um, and also feel free to contact Vention for a free consultation with an automation expert. Um, in this example, we're looking at an example where we're doing two shifts per day. Um, they're eight hour shifts. We're running about 75 parts per shift um, with a cost of equipment of around 60,000 US dollars. And if we add all that up, there's a few more parameters, but um, we're gonna keep those kind of constant throughout the rest of this. Um, this gives you a payback of less than eight months, right? So a really attractive payback. And we're gonna be looking at some graphs over the next few slides, but we're gonna highlight this example uh, with that little circle there. Um, so first graph here is we're looking at the effects of increasing production on shortening the payback period. And so what we see here is we're, the different lines, we're varying the shifts per day. Uh, and then we're also looking at the effect of increasing shift duration, right, from eight to 12 hours. And that little circle there shows us where we were at in our last example, which was about eight months, right? Um, and this shows that how increasing production, whether it's increasing shift duration or increasing shifts per day, can drastically reduce payback period. And we can see that running 24 seven operation with three shifts a day, 12 hours a day can lead, here, for example, to less than three months, right? So you can get payback extremely quickly by automating a machine tending operation. That's not to say everybody's going to be able to do that, right? It can be difficult to justify 24-7 operation. Um, but like we saw, even having two shifts a day uh, at eight hours a day can also still be very attractive. And this is kind of a, a result of any automation project, uh, basically these fixed cost investments in automation have a major effect when we increase production on reducing the payback period. The effect of um, kind of right-sizing the overall robot cell, right? So we're um, looking at that in terms of parts capacity. So if we consider parts capacity as the autonomy that the cell can have, then we can think of the smaller the parts capacity, the more often the operator is going to have to come and refill the station, right? So again, now we're looking at what happens if we increase parts capacity uh, greatly. And we see that actually past a certain point, um, it's actually, we're not going to change our payback that much, right? And that is basically because once we've refilled once per shift, it really doesn't change that much, right? Having that extra capacity. Um, it, it can improve it if we do, for example, one refill every two shifts. Uh, that's not something we're really considering here, um, but it's still kind of interesting and kind of leads to this simple rule of thumb here, which is to aim for one refill for, per shift. Um, you know, in the simpler scenarios, that's kind of going to be something where you can ensure that you've right-sized your equipment, you've optimized it, and you're not paying for capacity that you're never going to use, all right? because past a certain capacity, the investment is just not going to be as effective. So again, simple rule of thumb is about one refill per shift. Uh, depending on the number of parts you're aiming to do, uh, that's going to determine the size of the parts presenter. Next is looking at the effects of the labor rate um, on the payback. And this is obviously extremely sensitive, right? Uh, since we're displacing the operator and repurposing them somewhere else, potentially doing higher value work. Um, obviously regional, it, this varies regionally. So depending on where you are, this could have a huge impact uh, on whether or not you decide to do this. We've ha we have this as a, a, an easy to use parameter, an easy to tweak parameter in our model. Um, and we can see it as, as we increase the labor rate, um, it, it drops drastically, right? And now we wanna see at, uh, the sensitivity to equipment costs, right? So now we're seeing that as the equipment increases, obviously our payback period is gonna increase. And there's a linear relationship here, right? Between equipment cost and the payback period. And what this basically tells us is that, you know, all things considered, if I'm not changing anything in my system, obviously yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that you're not gonna wanna pay more. So you should only really pay for extra features, right? If it's getting you extra performance, then it can be justified, right? We can tweak different parameters in the model. Um, and so this is really the only times we should be considering paying a bit more is if we're getting extra features out of it. So now finally, I hope I've given you kind of a good idea of the different 
ways that payback might be affected by the parameters of your different use case, you might have recognized, okay, I mean, if I'm expecting things to go differently, um, you know, with my machine shop or with my company in the next few months, you can kind of see how that would affect maybe uh, the justification of payback. Um, now we can kind of, we can take a look at some case studies, um, some interesting projects that Vention has done in the past. Um, so this first one here is machine tending with two integrated range extenders. So we've got two UR10Es there uh, with simple flat part trays right in front of them. And these are actually on range extenders on the back there. We've also got an option here. This is the same as the first project that we saw. So an overhead range extender. This one is 40 feet long. And we're actually tending three Haas CNCs here with a single UR10. Um, it's a 40 foot long slide. Like I said, it uses a rack and pinion actuator. And uh, basically everything is controlled from the UR robot, right? Via IO communication with the CNCs. Uh, we've used, there's even an automated in-feed station at the other end of the CNCs. And in this particular case, there's about two minutes machining time. So it ensures the robot's basically busy shuttling back and forth between machines and outfeed and infeed uh, basically the entire time. And this actually uses a dual gripper as well so that the, the, the robot doesn't have to um, go take out a part, go drop it off, pick up another part you know, that's potentially 40 feet away. It's already carrying that next part um, with it so it can just directly swap it out. Uh, here's an interesting one where we've actually um, so added you know many extra features to this particular one. So it's a robot stand with autonomous bid picking. Um, so this uses the acting assistant from Energid. Uh, so basically, this allows the robot to pick from a randomly sorted bid, right? So if you have smaller parts or parts where it's difficult, or in whatever process you're making, they're just not organized and it's difficult to refill a station uh, so that the parts are consistently presented. Just putting them in a bin randomly like this and using a 3D vision system to randomly pick them from an unstructured bin, uh, using a very easy to configure software interface that Energid has made, and which allows you to set up um, with no expertise required, basically, uh, is another option as well that we wanted to highlight here. And we've done some of these types of autonomous bin picking stands. Um, another overhead range extender. I can't show the fully deployed image here, but this was a project um, with a dual overhead range extender. So kind of like the last project we saw uh, with the overhead range extender, but this time with two robots on the same rack and pinion track. Um, and so these two robots actually tend to two machines. And what they did was actually kind of interesting here. They had one robot dedicated um, strictly for infeed, right? So one robot was always picking parts off of a conveyor and feeding into the machines. And the other robot was strictly dedicated to outfeed. All right, so it would go back then to the two machines and take the parts out. And this is a really interesting project um, where essentially it ended up being integrated with an area scanner so that operators could pass through. I mean, this is this is obviously kind of an, an advanced type of project. We see a lot of different types of projects, but just wanted to highlight um, all the different options that are available. And depending on the, the, the floor space constraints and the environmental uh, aspect of you know needing operators and humans to still be able to interact in the same space as the robots uh, allows you to cons consider all these different architectures. And so that's really all we had today. Um, and so I'm happy to take any questions now.